He's a veteran. He's hardworking. And most importantly, he's my dad. Brewman's senior Bob Hunter joins us on the Brewman's podcast today. Thank you for hanging out with us. My name is Rob Hunter. His name is Mike Russell. If you're watching on the video, my dad sitting right in the middle going yes. by Bob today. And each week we gather around a beer. We just thought it'd be great to have a conversation with my dad, see what's going on. So, Mike, what are we drinking this week? Oh, well, buddy, it's your call. It's your, it's your special month as you have finally jumped off that evil, evil wagon. And we are celebrating your favorites here locally in Arizona. And this is the Dragoon IPA, one of the best from our buddies down south. Oh, look at that. Oh, one of my favorite bar camping barbecue beers. Back. Great, great way to do it. Dad, what do you got? You drinking anything down there? Dad's joining us from Florida. I have brought a special brew. For you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the Rolling Rock. The this Rolling was Rob's Rock. college drink. I want you to know, because it was like $3 a case. <laughs> but I did bring yeah. one just to show you. And not only is it, it's a 25-ounce. <laughs> that is fantastic. Perfect. And, and I'll, I'll tell you something, uh, Brewman Senior, that, uh, that that was actually my college beer of choice as well. And now, not because it was cheap. It's because I was trying to date a girl that would only drink Rolling Rock. So I was all about Rolling Rock. Cool green bottles. And I was like, oh, yeah, man, I'm, drinking, I'm drinking craft beer now. Yeah. That was for me. It was because my roommate at the time in college was 21. So he was allowed to drink beer and keep it in the dorm. And he liked Rolling Rock. And I'm like, all right, I guess I'll drink Rolling Rock. Because I had tried beer before, and I was like, this is nasty. That was the least nastiest of the beers, at least at the time. Rolling Rock. So that's a good way to start, Dad. So you're not much of a beer drinker, but you are a Bacardi drinker on the regular. True. True. So if you go back and you look at how you started drinking, you obviously – you uh, turned 18, we'll say a while ago, when the drinking age was 18. <laughs> just a few years ago. Just, yeah. Just, a few years. Yeah, just like yesterday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What did you start drinking? And was it like, okay, I'm 18? Because now everybody, when you turn 21, it's like a big deal. Everybody goes out and does the same thing. When you turned 18, was it the same? Because you were just like signing I, up for I, the military. I brought some of my, the special beers that we were able to drink. If you remember, craft beers probably came in, what, the mid-60s? They started... In the United States, so somewhere like so, we had some special beers that we got to drink. Budweiser, <laughs> Miller, all Miller. There you go. Bring the highlight. When I, when I really got out and out about Bush, <laughs> this was the highlight. That's it. So, if you really want to know why I didn't start to drink beer, that's what beer was in the '60s, and it really you, didn't have a lot of taste to it. Yeah, you just threw you just threw strike one, strike two, strike three. I'm gonna drink the party. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. Why do I drink hot stuff? Yeah, that's probably why. <laughs> yeah, that makes total sense. Now you need to crack. Can can you crack? Can you crack open the uh, the uh, the Rolling Rock? Which one of those are you gonna drink? I, I'm actually. I hate to do this to you, but I actually actually brought one that I can drink. There you go. Is, that's is that's there you go. So I'm gonna crack, crack that one. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now, now, just watching you do that, and I see, I see you kind of, you know, look uh, camera right, camera left. I now see where Rob got his beard game from. You oh, guys yeah. have, you guys have very strong beard game. They're both, both these beards are just they're they're lined, they're chiseled, and they're, they're almost identical. Except that uh, Rob, uh, Rob went with the uh, chin music, and uh, uh, Brewman Senior uh, left it off there. It's just, it, yeah, wow, it's a family yeah. thing. Well, Rob has never seen me without a mustache. I've had I had a mustache since I was 19 years old. I've never shaved it off. <laughs> so he's never seen me without a mustache. And then it came down to this, and I went to this. I had it like Rob had it. So different, yeah, you know, different look. It's Which a family dad, thing. It is. And Dad was one of the guys that stuck out the mustache, even when mustaches weren't cool. Like he just said, kept do kept with it. So I always appreciated that. About yeah. your dad. But he would walk by me if he shaved the mustache. I, I wouldn't even recognize him because of that. <laughs> I might not recognize myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I used to have I used to have long hair, like really long hair. And my father told me, he said, he said, I'm gonna go away on a business trip. If I come back and that hair isn't cut, I'm you're out. You kick me out of the house. He hated the fact I had long hair, couldn't stand really? it. 
So when he when he left, I took that I took those clippers, put the number two guard on, and just <laughs> and I haven't had long hair since. I'm like, this wow. is great. But I didn't recognize myself. Well, <laughs> one guy like past the mirror. I'm like, who's that guy? Yeah, <laughs> it's just such a difference when you just change something with facial hair or hair. Oh, hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's go back to the to the 1960s, Bobo. You're coming of age. Because we don't really talk about this anymore because obviously time has passed. What was it like being a teenager as you turned into the 1960s? You grew up in Massachusetts, and there you are, 15, 16 years old, hanging out. Take us back. Tell us a story. No, the, the 60s probably was twofold. We'll call uh, 1960 to 65 halfway. Uh, I think the, the early 60s probably was, uh, if you remember, rock and roll music was kind of dying a little bit. And uh psychedelic music was coming in and soul music was coming in so we, we kind of live with that part of it um plastic was big plastic had just made its scene if you i mean that's that yeah i mean everything okay. became plastic. plastic bags were were the, the thing uh we had no air conditioning in life so <laughs> if you in your house, you open, the air conditioning was open in the windows uh, <laughs> uh, probably uh one of the one of the things i think about most was we had black and white tv until probably the mid 60s uh we had to get up off our dead butts and, and uh, actually change the channel because <laughs> you didn't have a remote control to change it and it was all three channels abc cbs and nbc that you could watch probably Went off about 10 o'clock at night and the little uh, network symbol came on and, and you couldn't watch TV anymore. So it wasn't more no 24 hour TV. Uh, we uh, we probably spent our days outside whenever we could. I mean, we never were in the house. I can remember going out in the morning at eight o'clock. We play football all morning. Then we come back, grab a quick lunch and we play baseball all afternoon. And you came home when the arc lights were going. Arc lights, you know, those are the things that are on the street in case people don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> when those came on, you could come home because it was safe to do so. You know, you you, could, you rode your bike everywhere when I was a young kid. Um, uh, I also remember that American cars were like monsters, the Cadillacs and the Oldsmobiles. Uh, they, were, long they, long. Were, they were huge. Uh, they had no air conditioning either. We had to crank down this. The uh, windows, we didn't have any power, so we had to reach over, no seat belts. So I don't know how we let us survive through no seat belts, you know. With, because the cars were so heavy, it was the loss of gross tonnage is what it was. You didn't need seat belts. You could Those, run into a rhino and just, just brush the blood off the front. The fenders didn't even dent. <laughs> no, he hit the bumpers and the bumpers kind of kill it, knocked it off. I broke my nose twice when I was a kid. When I used to stand in the front seat when my mother used to drive, and I hit the I hit the dashboard twice, broke my nose. So nice. <laughs> uh, it's it's was saying, um, you know, really that was the early part was was really when I was a kid growing up. We used, like I say, we spent a lot of time. We had a lot of friends. Played a lot of baseball, uh, a lot of league baseball. Uh, but the second half was kind of when I graduated from high school, and then uh, you know. Things happen, you know. Kennedy got shot in the in the in the early, in the early uh, '60s. There, and life changed a little bit. Um, I think we probably, I, I you're well aware that I spent a little time in the in the in the service, uh, did a little stint over in uh, Vietnam. So it was a little different for us. But I did ha they did have some good times there too, because I get transferred to uh, California uh, in the San Francisco area. So I just wanted to share a little story that Haight-Ashbury was the hippie district of California back in that day. And it was quite strong, really. I mean, uh, smoke shops were like lined up on each side of the street. And even though uh, you didn't know they were there, you know, they were hidden. <laughs> <laughs> so you go down the street and it was really quite the, quite the place to visit at the time. I was in the military. So naturally, I, had, I was the only short-haired person in the place. but. Uh, it was it was just a different experience that I probably wouldn't have seen in New England uh, and spent some time there. So uh, you know, my it was it, it was twofold life. It was my fun life as a kid growing up, and then and the second part of life being in the military and being away from home and and 
I kept going west. I went from Memphis, Tennessee to California to Atsugi, Japan to Penang, uh, Vietnam, and uh, and finally made it back uh, after after five years, almost four, no, four years and, and change. So uh, the sixties was it was an interesting time. It was really really kind of special. Music was good, special music there, or at least my in my world. I want, to, I want to talk about the music part of this because you know your son is known here locally to a lot of people in the radio industry as we knew him early as Hip Hop Rob because <laughs> Rob was all about it. Not only did Rob just like hip hop music, Rob embraced hip hop music, oh, yeah. Rob, Rob embraced the entire culture, Rob studied the culture, Rob has been, done a, a lot of educating himself on all of that. And he credits Ruman Sr with introducing him to that genre of music. Now you mentioned tw music twice, just in this podcast alone. So obviously music is a big part of your life too. Tell us a little bit about that transition and then introducing your son to uh, the world of the hip hop. Well, I'm not sure it was hip hop back then, but, <laughs> but it, was, it was a different genre. Um, uh, we, I think we always had music. We always, I mean, uh, we had a, we had a, we had bought a van one time and, and uh, we always had music on the van and, and they, you know, we had separate speakers and stuff for Rob and the, and the kids in the back. Uh, but we always had some kind of music going on. Uh, I, I like soul music a lot. I like uh, R&B a lot. And I like, um, uh, I mean, we, we, I grew up with the Temptations and the Four Tops and uh, Diana Ross and, and, and one side of the business. And then we had the Beach Boys and... Um, Jan and Dean for the for the surf side. I did. I, I love the beach a lot. Still do, and so we spent a lot of time at the beach. But that was the music that you kind of listened when you went to the beach. You know, the, the, all that uh, beach crazy stuff. Uh, but at home, we kind of listened to soul music. It was because better to dance to. I mean, really, uh, it was good music to dance to. We went to a lot of dances when we were kids, and and that's really what we wanted to hear. And that's probably where we get the uh, hip hop is, is a derivative of soul music at some point, um, and that's kind of where the music came from. And we can we can both agree. I think you and I can both agree the Beatles are garbage. <laughs> I say it all the time. I'm so sick of people hyping the Beatles up. Beatles are not. It's awful. Different different type of music. Let's say I, I'm not, I never was a Beatles, I never was a Beatles fan to the nth degree. I actually like the Dave Clark Five a little bit better. They were kind of on that same. All <laughs> like right. The, okay. Hermits, hermits, and <laughs> some of that other crazy stuff. Yeah, but but you get you got to have to admit that the Beatles did a lot for music. I mean, they really sure. did. They was they were probably the Elvis Presley of that group of folks. That, that, mm -hmm. But I'm never was a great fan of them. But no. Okay. Good. I'm just glad we just come to an agreement. We can always do that over a beer. Yeah. Yeah. We, see, we, what we it's can all always about. find something. We always find something to love and something to hate. So I will. <laughs> I remember being in the car. So I want to talk to you about cars too, Dad, because you have had many cars in your life. But you know, we have. You know, when you're a kid and you go to the different cars, because you used to drive a lot for work, because you were a district manager in the supermarket, so you'd spend a lot of time in the car. So every like two or three years, you get a new car because the mileage would get high. But I remember. Of all these memories back in the old cassette tape days, Beach Boys. What was that album? The Beach Boys album. We used to used to play that all the time. Surfing USA, I think, is what it was. Yeah. Well, is that Deuce Coop was the? I think Deuce Coop was the, was the album, and they had that picture of that thirty two blue Deuce Coop on it. That was like a rocking car. <laughs> and then yeah. the other one would be Lionel Richie. We used to listen to Lionel Richie a yeah. lot in the car, yeah. dancing on the ceiling. Oh yeah, Penny Lover. Oh yeah. The good we, went stuff. That, we went to that concert, uh, the Dancing on the Ceiling concert, and when they came down from the, they had the, they were on like wires. They came down and they were dancing. It was like and they were doing flips. It was pretty cool <laughs> at the time. That was back, you know, sixty four maybe somewhere around there. Maybe maybe you know, it'll be a little later than that because you weren't born. Yeah, it was later now. It was way later than that. I remember that song. But still, you know, yeah. it, you know, but that's where oh. it all traces back, which is the fun yeah. part about it. And I remember one time you had so I remember you had a Toyota Supra. Back in the day, you had a red. Was it a Firebird or a Thunderbird? Firebird, yeah, that was that was I a nice had, car. I had a red Firebird. Oh yeah, it was a Firebird uh, three hundred and fifty. It was it was nice. <laughs> Dang. Well, I remember because it was like a smaller car than I was. And the Supra was pretty small, but that was like when when my brother Chris, who's three years younger than me, when we were really little, you had the Supra, 
And then you kind of did the sedan. I remember you had the 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 green Bonneville, which oh, yeah. I loved. That was because yeah. I think that was about the time I learned how to drive. And I think you let me drive it once. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is there a story behind that? Oh, I no. yeah. that, 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 that was a good that question. I've go never back. asked this. Yeah, I've never asked. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I had a few cars. Yeah. My, well, why did you let me drive the Bonnevilles? But Mike really wants it. That's what I really want to know. I, I don't, don't even know. If, yeah, I might not even remember if I, maybe I was too nervous. It was probably me. I was probably like, was probably, I don't want to drive dad's, dad's nice car. I can I can answer that for you, Bob. I can answer that because now that I have a 15 year old with her learner's permit, she said, Dad, can I drive? No. <laughs> Dad, can I drive? No. I, I well, totally I'm, understand. Yeah. I'm thankful I haven't because I drive with them when I come to Arizona <laughs> and I don't want to drive with them again. <laughs> this guy's got a lead foot. <laughs> he does. <He's> <laughs> it's a good thing he has brakes in the car, which I guess that's kind of <laughs> Does he know where the brakes are? No. Yeah. <laughs> and and I Amy, mean, they, 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 they must have learned from each other. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I, think, I think Rob thinks the gas pedal's an on off switch. Yeah, yeah that's, basically. <laughs> but see, this is a very interesting thing because when I, I left Massachusetts, I moved to Florida and it's much more wide open, which where dad, you spent half your time. Now the roadways in the state are so long that the speed limit in many places is 75. So when I was driving back and forth to work, it was about a 45 minute to an hour ride. I'm driving on this highway and it's, you know, four in the morning. There's nobody on the road. So 75 becomes 80 becomes 85 and then you get used to going 80 82 miles per hour all the time so that's where the lead foot really came from plus i used to drive the first car that i had was my grandmother's car bob's dad bob's mom rather from bob's dad who mime as we called her saved it and this was one of those big 1984 buicks that was you know 18 feet long but it had a big v8 engine and it would get up and go and i'd be driving around like man this thing is like a it had like 18,000 miles on it when he got it. <laughs> it really did. It was a 1984. I got it in, I think, 94. And it had 34,000 and change on it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, thing a bump. that thing hit a bump and do like this for about oh, half yeah. a mile. Oh, yeah. That's just, yeah. They, they're nice. Not anymore. Not anymore, oh. those guys. So let's talk about that because you growing up in the, in the fifties and sixties, you saw all the, really the cool cars and what stands out to you? Do you have like a favorite line of cars going back to the fifties and sixties? I remember when we were a kid used to have an old Lincoln, if I remember correctly. 55 Lincoln Capri, two door coupe. That was, that was a shop car. That was a, yeah. That that went, (laughs) that went in the, it was so big. This is a true story. When I went to put it in the garage, it wouldn't have fit. So I had to cut the hole in a wall in the back because they had those big bumpers, <laughs> those big uh, bullet bumpers in the front, and, and those stuck out. So I had, to, I had to cut the wall in the back of the garage. <laughs> That's awesome. That and then is, when I, I got, never knew that. I pulled down the garage door, it just fit. It, it just, it was. Gosh. It's unbelievable. That's that funny. Is amazing. You know, certainly, I mean, we we had the funny. The probably one of the one of the my favorite cars was the Firebird because it was sporty looking. It it, it was quick, uh, and it had a phone in it. The an old what? phone. In it. That yeah, is like, next a level. Phone with, a, with, a, with a cord, you know. <laughs> and, it wasn't, and it wasn't that you plugged it into the cigarette lighter. This was hardwired into the car. <laughs> this, oh, it was the wow. first one I ever had, yeah. And before I had that was the bag phone. I had the bag phone that you carried with you. And you went oh, everywhere. Yeah. You that on the top. But this was the first car I ever had with a phone in it. It was pretty Wasn't nice. Like you're the calm guy in special ops or something. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you get a lot of work done in your car when you're driving. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's yeah. awesome! I think one of the most fascinating things about we're with we're with Rob Hunter's dad, Brewman Senior, and one of the most amazing things that just doesn't seem to happen anymore. One of the coolest things about you is that you stayed in the same industry, the same gig, the same job. You worked your way up. There was retirement involved, and I mean, you started day one all the way to the last day in the supermarket industry. And what was that? What was that mindset? Because me. 
and Rob will attest to this, that I'll, I'll see myself on stable ground, notice that I'm on stable ground and go, oh, look, a shovel and want to go do something else. I, I have that kind of career ADD where you didn't. So tell me about that, that mindset, like I'm in this job. I'm not going anywhere. I got it's it's good living. Take us there. Well, again, probably a little bit different time span in life, because once you had a stable job, it was kind of the, your father did that and the father before that did that and the grandfather did it and everybody did that, uh, kind of stayed with their job. Uh, it wasn't necessarily what I intended to do in life. Uh, I mean, it was a part time job for me when I was in high school. That's how it started. Um, but I got to like it a little. I got to like it a lot. And when I came back from the service, I came back to it because, first of all, it was a guaranteed job. So it gave me money when I came back. Uh, and then I, I had a good store manager there that really was kind of helpful in life. Uh, you know, I said, you know, this is a pretty good career if you stay with it and, and do things. And, and I kind of advanced to the company fairly quickly. Uh, and I got to like the job. The, the thing that was good about the job is it was a different role. I, I'd be a store manager, district manager, director of operations, a series of different things that I did. So it wasn't like you had the same job. You weren't yeah. doing the yeah. same thing every day for 50 years. You did different things. So that was very good in one respect. The, another respect was that we were bought out four times. <laughs> so every time you got bought out, it was like having a new company. Okay, and you yeah. had to do new rules and you had to do different things. So it wasn't like you were going into a, a plant every day and cutting soles or whatever you do. You, you went and it was different every day. And then the last three or four well, about probably, well, I guess, 10 years, I was in the corporate office, which was kind of nice because I didn't have that weekend scenario anymore. Because when I was in the retail side of the business, weekends, holidays were just part of everything. You know what I mean, you think when I started with the company, it was 830 to 5, Monday through Saturday, and we stayed open late on Friday night till 830. And we were closed Sundays. So you always knew you had a Sunday off. That's how retail was. Oh, it wasn't a bad job. Uh, and then all of a sudden the world changed and we were open Sundays. We never were open a holiday either. So we, then we started open holidays. We opened till 10 o'clock. Then it was 24 hours. So it, the whole job changed at the end. But the last 10 to 12 years when I was in the corporate office, it, it was weekends off for the most part. And so that stress was, level uh, went from like here to... Uh, you still had responsibility, but you had I had a team of people that worked for me that were were able to handle things if I wasn't there uh, also. so and how many years total were you doing that? Uh, forty seven years. okay. and that's and that's what just, it, I think it's amazing. I think it's something you should you should celebrate. I think it's it's just <laughs> it, it, no, and I'm being serious because yeah. you see so many so many people like like me, I think I think Rob and I's generation started this. We're like, we'll go try to do something new. And we'll, we'll try this. And the, the grass is greener over here. And now we're getting into the gig economy where young people are doing three, four things at a time. And it's not just stick to it one shot. Like my dad's best friend started at Arrowhead um, Aerospace as a janitor and retired senior vice president of sales. So just, you know, there's it's it's just a it seems like that's not even a thought anymore to stick to wow. one thing the whole way through. Yeah, and, and I see that in, in, in people I talk to or, uh, or around that, you know, it's it's certainly a different mentality today. If there's a better job and it pays more or something I like a little bit better, I'm ready to go because I, I can do that. Uh, so. What was it? So you're in the supermarket business. So you come back from the military. So you did like 16, 18, if I remember correctly. You're, you know, doing your high school job. You go join the military. You come back, you get the job. What was that first advancement where you were like, this is this isn't bad? Because if I remember correctly, too, I was you were 30 when I was born. Were you a store manager at that point? Because that's that's pretty young to be a store manager. I, I when I come back from the service, it probably took me about two, two and a half years to become a store manager. But again, it was a lot of, you know, I spent a little time doing this and a lot of time doing that. So uh, I was fairly young as a store manager, uh, and but it was a again I told you I had a good mentor, which is important in life. I had a good mentor as a store manager who taught me a lot of stuff. Other people may have not taken that route, uh, and then when I became a store manager, then I had a really good district manager that was also a good mentor. 
So you need people to help you move along in life. You can't, you can do it yourself, but it's certainly nice to have somebody that's uh, on your team, so to speak, and, and will speak up for you. And that's, that's how, what was helpful for me. Uh, you know, by the time I was 30, I think I had probably been in my second store uh, as, a, as a store manager. So it was, yeah. again, the mentorship is big. That is. I mean, especially in, in a business that has trajectory. And if you learn the skills to go. So when you're a store manager, you manage the store. I mean, everybody pretty familiar with what a store manager does. But when you become the district manager, and this is what I remember, this was like kind of my formative years. You would travel around all over. The, you had a district, right? So district manager. So you would go in and you would work with the store managers to get the stores correct. It is very interesting because I spent about five years working in the same supermarket that dad did, Shaw's <laughs> Supermarkets. But it was funny because you would get to know certain people who knew you and they would say certain things about you like, well, that that your dad is real. He's tough, but he's really <laughs> fair at the same time. Like there was the it was kind of weird seeing you in that role. And there'd be some days that I'd be working and I'd be stocking shelves and you would come in. And I remember one time we had a manager. His name was David. And, you know, I was rocking the high school scruff thinking I was cool. He made me go shave in the bathroom because dad was coming to the store. <laughs> <laughs> well, they had, they had, we used to, we used to be funny because they used to say they used to put a GPS on the manager's, on, on a district manager's car. So they knew <laughs> where he was going. And it, and, it, and it was a communication device between the store. Store A would call store B. And he said, he left, he took a right out of the parking lot. <laughs> so I'm assuming he's headed for your store. So you may want to be ready in 10 or 15 minutes because he's probably walking through. <laughs> and the store managers to tell me, oh yeah, we, we'd be calling as soon as, as soon as they left, the next store knew you were coming. <laughs> that's, like, that's it. And I remember yeah. this other time, there was this, he was, what was, so was the store manager, assistant store manager. There's another guy named Bob. And I think he knew you were coming one day. And, you know, I was starting to try to figure out, is this something I want to pursue as a career? So I'm in college. I'm getting towards the end of my college career. So I'm starting to learn a new skill at the Superbook, how to order things. So when the, the stock runs low, you go into the computer system, you, you put your order in. So this guy, Bob, shows me. And it just so happens that you came into the store one day and you saw us in the office. And I remember him and I knew he had pulled one on me because he goes, oh, man. I didn't want him to see me do that. He had this fake like oh. look on his face. And I was like, whatever, man, come on. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to impress awesome. the big boss. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's kind of what happens in the supermarket business behind the scenes. So oh, yeah. what was the transition like when you went from district manager working weekends to going to the corporate office? So you have your own team. What was that? You know, because I think you were probably what fifty five at this point, fifty two. So you had spent, yeah, you know, yeah. basically twenty three to fifty two. Let's call it thirty yeah. years yeah. before you know after the military, and you finally get to go. Oh, this is what it's like to have a Saturday off. <laughs> it was nice, actually. <laughs> it, it, it was in the, in the department I ran really was uh, Monday through Friday, so it was it was. It, it, it just kind of falls in when you go on that job, you go Monday to Friday. Then we decided that, well, we're open seven days a week, so we should at least be open Saturdays. So we opened Saturday mornings for the group. I was on a uh, communication team that we did a lot of communication for the stores, and we did uh, all the like customer complaints we did. We did uh, distribution types of things. So we were open Saturday, so we, the team, they didn't really want to, but they, they did. And then we came with a nice rotation. I had some people that actually wanted to have Wednesday off because it's a better day to go shopping if you want to do something, you know, because everybody at that time was everybody was off Saturdays and Sundays. So when you went to the supermarket, it was busy as heck. Uh, so they loved to have Wednesday. They went and did all the errands and stuff. So, so we were able to, instead of me saying, you're going to do this, and you're going to do that, we kind of came up with a team concept that said, okay, what we're going to do is the people that want to, take Wednesday off or Tuesday off. We'll give them those days off and they can work on Saturdays. And they were, they were happy with that and things went along pretty good. Uh, then came Sundays, not so easy on Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> People come in. Uh, but so what we did is we came up as that was an extra day of work, extra pay. And you know, then people definitely volunteered to, to do that. Uh, me, it was, you know, pretty much, uh, 
uh, pretty pretty special to come in and have mostly most Saturdays and Sundays off. And we talked about it when uh, you know we spent a lot of we spent a lot of weekends together because we didn't spend weekends weekdays together. So we try to get the best we could out of the weekend time, do as much as we could. Try, always try to have something planned for you and the kid, you and uh, Chris, uh, to be out and doing something. Uh, that was that was nice. That was probably the best part of having weekends off is spending time with you guys. I'm gonna go ahead and jump. I'm going to go and jump to that right now because uh, your your son comes to you and says, I want to be in the radio business. I know that you've, you've been in the supermarket business. I've been in the supermarket business with you, but now I want to go to school for this. I want this to be my career. And you think, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. The radio business, you had to have known that any media, you're going from town to town. And that's just how you know our, our business works. And you are a man that has stayed, boom, I'm in one job, one career, one career path all the way to retirement. Did you try to sell them off of that? Or did you think, wow, that's a cool idea? I don't think I did. Did I try to sell you off of it? I no, don't think not, so. not one time. I, I, don't, I don't think not once that I, I mean, uh, everybody should be able to choose what they want in life. And, and uh, I didn't, to be honest, I probably didn't think it was going to hang in there. It was probably just a, something that, a, a niche that he thought he might squeeze into for a little while and then go on to something different. But as it is, it worked out okay, uh, I think. You know, one little place you didn't care too much for, <laughs> but other than that, uh, I think overall it's you know it, it it's pretty happy. It seems pretty happy. Life okay, and and uh, I support it. I think it's a it's a good thing, you know. And and you're right. I think Mike though, is it, it, the scary times is people changing jobs. You don't know. It, it's kind of that mentorship. I think I was talking a little bit about earlier that if if you if you're in Phoenix and you have a good mentorship and, and things are going for you. What happens when I go to San Diego and to a new location, I have new people that I don't know. How is that going to transition to the rest of my life? Will it help me or will it hinder me? So that's always the piece you got to do on your own. At that point, you got to make sure that people support you. Uh, so. And now your boy's, yeah. your boy's doing, now your boy's doing afternoon drive right now in the number 13 market in the nation. So. I'm hanging around with you. Yeah, no, he's good. He did Could be good. worse. Could be worse. Yeah, and I thought, I thought that was very interesting too because you never really did that. I mean, you know, I went to Emerson College in Boston, which is a media school. I mean, it, there was no backup plan. There was no escape hatch. You can't go get like a minor in engineering and go oh, spin off and do that. And you know, there was talk about when I was a kid whether I should go and and pursue something that seemed interesting or you know go to the safe career and do something like engineering. But obviously, I wanted to go to Emerson, and you never got in the way of that. You were like, let's go do this. And I do remember when we went on the tour of Emerson. And oh, let's just say there was some interesting people who put the tour on. and But it was like eye-opening for me and eye-opening for Dad. Like, if you're going to do this decision, this is a whole different world that you're going to step into. Similar to what you said about hate Asbury, Dad. When you're walking down the street as a kid from, from Massachusetts, and you're on the West Coast now, and you got all these hippies, this is that was sort of my hippie sort of introduction, if you will. Granted, it was only like 20 miles from home or 15 miles from home, but that was like the cool part about that experience was okay. Here you even go. Live, even living living in the suburbs and going into the city is a whole different transition, you know, because you're not used to you're not used to that uh, environment, and and you you did very well at it. <laughs> so, you know, I enjoyed it. That was a good yeah. time. And I got to do my hip hop radio show, which is there you go. all I wanted to do. <laughs> there we go. That's what it was. It's exactly. all because of you, Brewman Senior. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Good supportive team there we had. <laughs> Definitely yeah. did. So let's talk about travel, too, while we're here. Because one of the things you just mentioned a while back in this conversation, at some point you and Brenda brought a conversion van. So that you could take us on vacations because, you know, at my, you guys, my, I think you and mom got divorced. I don't know. I was seven or eight years old. Then you met Brenda and Brenda had a son, Ryan. So the five of us go on these amazing family vacations, because as you mentioned, we didn't have all the time, but we had good quality time. So we would take a week or two in the summer In a week we would spend driving around in the van and we'd go to places like Hershey, Pennsylvania. We would drive down to Virginia and we had a great time in that van. So what was that decision? Like, okay, we need to, we need to figure out time to, to get the kids together and, and, and go hang out together as a family. 
I'm not sure that that might have been the way it went. I think if I if I recollect it, this was many years ago, and in my in my aging years here, I might I think I remember the story. Uh, the three boys and I went out one afternoon, or one yeah, in the morning, and I said we went by a Dodge place, and they had a Dodge Sherrod van in the front, and the, and they looked beautiful. And I and I said, oh, let's go and take a look at that. So the kids were all excited, you know, again. We're, they're they're we're probably 10 years old or whatever. Like, yeah, what do you think? So we go in there, and I can just imagine what the dealership said. Oh, boy, here's a guy with three kids. Like, <laughs> oh, man, this is going to be terrible. I'm going to waste my time. So we we actually went in. We we pick up this van, this this uh, conversion van, Sherrod thing. Uh, had, it had a TV in the back. It had uh, a radio in the back for the kids, had earphones that the kids could listen to. So it kind of met all the criteria that we needed. So if we were driving, we could listen to music up front. They could listen to music or watch the TV. And we ended up buying We ended up buying it. I think the guy was in shock that sold it to us because, he, you know, we had to spend an hour in there doing paperwork back in those days because everything was, you know, manual. Uh, and sure enough, we, we drove the, we drove the van home, uh, and I think we drove the van home. We left the car there. Brenda and I had to go back and pick up the car. <laughs> uh, and then that kind of started our adventures. And we, uh, we did, I, I do have to admit, we did some great things in, in the, in the van. We just, we went all as much as we could until it finally kind of crapped the bed at one point where it was, it wasn't driving anymore. It wasn't drivable. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a good time. And I, I, and I think it was kind of good. You guys liked it because you could do your own thing in the backseat and uh, listen to what you wanted to. And you were probably listening to hip hop music back then. I don't percent, hundred percent. In fact, I, I met Chuck D from public enemy at the 2016, one of the conventions that I was covering the political conventions. And I told him the story. I remember we were somewhere in the van and I went to go buy one of the Public Enemy albums. And I remember taking it in the van and putting it right into the, the CD player in the back seat. And I made Chris and Ryan listen to it with me. And they were like, what's wrong with this kid? <laughs> so wait a second. I didn't, I didn't know this. So is Brother Brew not a hip hop guy? He was back then, but yeah, not, he never got as deep into it as I did. And nor okay. did Ryan. It was you know, much more like pop. When hip hop was pop, they liked that stuff. They just they didn't dive into deep into the pool like me. Brother Bruin, maybe it's maybe it's just his look, but he gives off a he gives off a country vibe. He yeah, does he like country. country. He does like country. Does he? Yeah, okay, he does. Yeah. I thought yeah. he I thought he was one of my people. I, 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 <laughs> he does. He does like country. Yeah. But it's it's funny you were mentioning it earlier. You were talking about like Motown and stuff like that. Like I grew up with a combination. And the same thing in my in my dad's car, the, the the eight track in the garage that he had while he's out doing yard work, and we were you know playing basketball, whatever it was. But I was it was a mix of like Smokey Robinson, The Temptations, the Four Tops, and then the Judds, Alabama. Like yeah. it, was, it, was this, it was this mix that I just so you know Rob and I have a very unique playlist that plays on Spotify while we're preparing for our show. It's a mix of all of that craziness. So, it, and so that's a, a tip of the hat to you and to my dad as well for at least introducing us to multi, uh, multi genres. And I, I really come to like country now myself. Uh, country's changed a lot too. I mean, it's not the typical country that you probably heard in the fifties and sixties. It's it's a variation of that, and uh, that's, it's 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 nice music to listen to. Yeah, Hank and Williams Singer could cure insomnia. Yeah. Really. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he must be. Wow, what is this? That's not country. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the funny things about aging, though, because you have such good memories of your stuff. So it's hard to in now to go, oh, music's because it was different when you're growing up, and those are your formative years. So you have this natural attachment to it. So yeah. same thing with country music. Like I like the newer country music versus the older country music. Because the newer country music is more used to what I used to listen to in the 80s and 90s versus the older country music. I'm like, that sounds way different. And that's, what, that's probably why I've become, a fan, and I won't say a fan, but certainly I like country music a little bit better than I did before. The twangy voice type of stuff has, has changed quite a bit. You know? And plus Carrie Underwood doesn't look bad when she's singing. <laughs> Not bad at all. <laughs> Not bad at that one little bit. No. no. That, is a statement. that is a statement of fact. 
Probably cut almost, that, right? make, yes. Almost <laughs> makes you want to watch the Sunday night football song. Almost. <laughs> almost. Not mm-hmm. quite. So, Dad, let's wrap up here because in your career, 47 years in the supermarket, four years in the military, now you're living a retired life. You live part-time in Florida, part-time in Maine. You got an awesome wife. You got, I think, pretty cool kids in in the three of us. I what agree with you. If you go back and you were like going to tell an 18 year old, an 18 year old that would listen, what would you tell them as like a good nugget of advice about life? And I always say that because most 18 year olds are like, yeah, whatever, old man, I'm not listening to you. First of all, yeah, I was going to say, first of all, if you had an 18 year old listen to me today, we'd probably be very difficult. <laughs> you know, that, that probably wouldn't happen. Um, I, I guess I tell them, first of all, find something that you're interested in in life. You know, uh, and may and maybe what you're interested in today may change because nine times out of ten, what, what you like today is going to change till tomorrow. So I'd say what you really need to do is find something that you like and pursue that as best you can and see if that works out for you. Um, I kind of appreciate the little things in life, uh, the things that make you happy today. You know, e- even if it's having dinner with your family, uh, going out to the beach for the day with some friends, uh, enjoy those while you can. Uh, cause, uh, those may change as you go along. Um, surround yourself with good people, uh, get rid of the bad blood because that's what can drag you down quickly. But, and they don't have to be a lot of people, just quality people. doesn't have to be a bunch of them, just good quality people. Um, this one may surprise you. Forget trigonometry, geometry, <laughs> get rid of all that crap because you're never going to use it. Uh, find yourself some financial books, figure out how to work money because that's probably the most important thing for you to do. Uh, try to get a financial planner in your life. I know you're 18 years old, but you know, maybe when you're 20, 22, after you've got a good solid job or something, get a financial advisor early in life to help you plan on that. You know, learn, learn what a 401k is and what a Roth is and what an IRA is and all those other things that will help you in the future. And, you, and that's the, probably the hardest thing to tell anybody because they want to spend it as soon as they get it. Uh, and, and, and that was one of the things that we were fortunate we didn't do. We kind of saved a little bit here in the company that I worked for. I had a great plan, uh, a savings plan for you. And I think I've told you this, Robert. If you can put 10% in a 401k and they'll match your 4 4%, 5%, that's big money at, at the end of your life. Uh, I mean, we were fortunate in my, my job that, we, we were able to do that. They met 6% at one point. And wow. Was, we gave 10, they gave six. Uh, and actually, as, as we got bought up by different companies, they went the other way. Uh, <laughs> at 18, they, they got to admit that they don't know everything. So, you, they, you know, admit to yourself you don't know everything. Learn and listen because some of us, all the folks have been there before. We've done that. Um, get off your devices. Enjoy the outdoors. Yes. I mean, that's important. I mean, really, I mean, I like, to, I like to be outside now more than ever. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time outside. I golf outside. I play pickleball outside. Uh, you know, Brenda and I walk quite a bit. Uh, don't bicycle as much as any, any, I did anymore. But, you know, being outside is important. Uh, it, it just, it's just good for your health. Um, save some money. And I wrote one other thing down. Keep healthy. Uh, I see people today, they don't look healthy and because it may be what they eat or maybe the way their lifestyle isn't right. But, you know, I live in a community here today where, uh, I, I thought it was a 55 and above community. I'm looking at now, I think it's a 75, maybe 80 and above community. Cause there's a lot of older people that have done good things in their lives, eating well, exercise well. There, you know, there's a lot of older folks that still have an active lifestyle. So uh, I'd encourage people to do that. Just stay healthy and eat, eat better and, and take care of yourself. I was, I was, t- Rob told me how old you were and I about slapped him because I thought he was making fun of you because you don't look a day over 55 and <laughs> you, you have been, and you haven't taken, it's because you take care of yourself and it's the way you carry yourself, the way you act. And when I got to meet you in person, I'm like, this, this, this guy really took care of himself. And I think that's the best piece of advice of all of it. I mean, money's money. I tell Rob all the time, they print more every single day. You, you, you have you and that's it. You know, you only that's got one of you. Not here. 
you know, and that's the thing. You know, I got a birthday coming up next week. Don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> Noted, sir. Noted. Yes. A, a check. A check will work if you want. A check. Okay. <laughs> On the way. I'll just send you some Venmo. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. There you go. So you mentioned golf, and I do want to. I do want to touch on this because that has been one constant in your life. So as long as I've been alive, and longer, you've been a golfer. What has that meant to you? Because it, that's your outdoor activity, your exercise, because you always walk. You know, you, at least you used to for a long time. You'd walk the golf course and you'd play, what, two, three times a week. You're still playing two, three, four times a week. What does it mean to you to get outside and hit that little white ball and chase it around, you know, a golf course? Well, again, it's, it's, it's all being outside. It's, you know, it's the, it's the sun. I like the sun, unfortunately, probably too much. Um, and uh, it's being outside. I, I, <clears throat> I, I play at least four times a week now because I'm retired. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't walk as much as I used to down here. In Maine, I walk every day. Uh, down here, everybody takes a cut, so it's it's a, a little less less activity. It's a lifestyle. Uh, <laughs> it's a lifestyle, and, and it's part of it's part of the shtick, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're walking. Who's that idiot walking? Here? <laughs> <laughs> Must be new. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but but golf golf to me is an individual sport. You can only blame yourself for your good days or your bad days. So you can't blame somebody else because you hit a bad shot. It's all about you hitting a bad shot. Uh, and that's what I like about golf. It's it's about me and the little white ball trying to fit in that stupid little hole. Uh, and some days it works and some days it doesn't. And uh, that's why I, I like it. I picked up pickleball recently because Brenda, Brenda's been playing it. And I've actually come to like it quite, quite a bit. So I'm going to play a little bit more. For those that don't know what pickleball is, it's a mini tennis, I call it. Uh, it's the same kind of idea. It's a smaller court. They play with a, like a wiffle ball. Uh, and hard paddles, uh, but same, same. You have to serve into a court, and it's back over a net. Uh, and and it's it's an active sport for older people, I guess is what I'd say. Okay. It keeps, and and actually, we have where I am now today, down in Timber Pines, we have more people that are tennis ball members than there are. I mean, uh, more people that are pickleball members than our tennis members. So people show up and say, "I want to be a pickleball member." Yeah, cost okay, you $10. I got to figure this out. I got to try this pickleball thing up because, yeah, Rob's talking about it and the Yaks are talking about it and Lady Brumance's family talking about it. I thought, okay, I'll give it a shot. I, I've got to give this a try, especially if there's actual pickleball memberships to places. I got to figure this out. <laughs> it's really, it, 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 you know, it, it took me a while to get used to it, Mike. I mean, I have to admit, it was, I said, oh, this is old people's tennis. Oh, but it's, it's not, and and you can make it as active as you want. I mean, uh, you can you can run after the ball. Uh, there's a lot of injuries in it because it's a hard court, so people fall and older people fall and get hurt and, and whatnot. So, uh, but I've been I'll take that. But golf is still my favorite. I'll, I'll probably never ever stop. I I, I liken myself uh, to um, what was the name of the movie with. Uh, Jack Lemon, where he's uh, you gave me on that one, Bobo. Bagger Vance, the legend of Bagger Vance, where they show Jack Lemon and he's walking down the 18th fairway and he falls down actually and, and has a heart attack. And um, and that sounds like a fantastic story, show. <laughs> the whole story is his recollection of life in uh, with with this one particular case. And he doesn't know he's dead yet, because he's still he's still alive in golf. And and I said that's probably me. That's if if they said I'll be I hope at 104 years old, <laughs> walking down. I like that plan. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I thought about this the other day, and I'm sure you've come along with me this because it's 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 mind blowing to me the the obsession with golf. And I played since I was seven years old. So much so that I've like taken years off because I've played so much golf. And I, I thought that I when I go to maybe the basketball courts with my son or, you know, playing catch with my son, things like that. There's no we put no pressure on ourselves in any other game or sport than golf. Yeah. Like golf is it, there. There's an, something there's something obsessive about it that we can't just go like Rob and I could go to the court today, just shoot around basket, you know, just goof around, make some, not make some, whatever. But if we make some, not make some on a golf course, it's a whole different mindset. So there's nothing like it. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's why, I mean, golf is my sport. I probably will be, and uh, I can't play basketball. Just uh, that was never my sport, you know, but uh, that's uh, what I do down I here. I played for six years, and it was never my sport. So, yeah. <laughs> Let's be honest. I practiced for six years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So other than that, we 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 our life is is pretty good with the way we planned it. But again, I got a financial advisor somewhere along the line there, probably a little later than I should have, and uh, he was very helpful, uh, able to put some things together for us, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, be able to be old and gray here. I like the sound of that. That's a good way to be yeah. right there. Mm -hmm. We'd like to see a little more of you out here, though. I'd like to. Now that, now that uh, you know, I've had my shots now, uh, Brenda is had her first. She's going to have her second. Uh, so uh, I feel here. a little bit to get out. You know, we, we, were, we were very nervous down here with, all, with the way Florida was going. And we kind of stayed pretty tight to the thing. But we, uh, we started to get out. And uh, I think uh, I hope to see Rob said he was going to try to get to, to us in July or August. I'm looking forward to that. It's tough. I guess one of the th toughest things in life for us today, at least for me, is uh, not seeing Rob and Chris. I haven't seen Chris for over a year now because uh, when I went, when and when we were at, I, I was going to meet with him for Christmas, uh, we had two incidences where we were uh, close to people that had COVID. And it was my, me first, so I couldn't see him. And then it was him second, so I never got to see him for Christmas. And Rob, I only get to see once a year. And uh, so I hope to make that at least twice a year going forward uh, and maybe more. So uh, well, Come out here in the first round. Of the the first okay. round of beer and golf is on me. Sounds good. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end mine with a, a little Bacardian diet. And I, there you go. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And good talking to you, Mike. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Rob, I love you and uh, hope to see you soon.